Good evening, everyone. Um, this is um, welcome to the uh, the December meeting of the Jean Winter Northeast Chapter of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. I'm the chapter chair, Victor Mastone. I want to let you know that this will be our last meeting in 2022, and probably our last meeting at the Peabody for at least six months, if not a year. We hope it's less, so does Ryan, I believe. We hope it's a lot less. Um, in the spring, we will be meeting at the Tapley Memorial Hall of the Danvers Historical Society on our usual meeting nights. The first meeting will be uh, January 17th, the usual time, 7 p.m. I don't have the speaker name with me, but we've got a speaker lined up already, and we'll do our, our meetings there through the end of May. And then we'll see what happens from that point forward. Uh, other than that, I should let you know that um, I said Mass Archaeological Society had its annual meeting uh, uh, two weeks ago. And, and yet again, I'm serving a second term as the president of the society as well as the chair of this chapter. You should be getting, those of you on our mailing list, email and otherwise, will be getting a solicitation letter from us. We decided that since COVID was over, uh, that we would finally start doing our annual appeal again. So hopefully you'll get that and feel supportive. Other than that, I should get on to our speaker tonight. Our speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Naomi Ritterford. I've known Naomi probably for about a decade, I guess, about 10 years, more or less. Uh, Naomi and I, um, have, she has actually volunteered in my office as a research fellow when I was the director of the Underwater Archaeology Board, and she continues to do that with um, my, my um, successor, David Robinson. Naomi helped us with our paleo landscape reconstruction, map analysis, our environmental review, background research. What I should tell you about Naomi, she's a, I always pronounce her wrong, a paleontologist, someone who studies fallen, but she also does a lot of landscape reconstruction, um, Holocene paleo, um, paleoecology, uh, wetland environment. So she's got a pretty broad background. She got her PhD from the University of London's Royal Hollowell, which is not an easy place to get into and quite a prestigious place to get your degree from. She had actually spoken to our chapter, I think it was two years ago, maybe three years ago. More than three years ago, she talked about her dissertation topic, which was the Sale Valley in Northeast France. So we've had um, the pleasure of her company before. She's also done some um, reconstruction of the prehistoric landscape on the in the Thames and, and um, River Valley. And she studied the uh, environment of Fair Isle in the Shetlands, where she's from originally. Uh, Naomi also is doing, uh, has done other kinds of um, pollen um, analysis in Maine is and not just the topics you're going to talk about today, but some work on a homestead in Somerset, Maine, as well as Fort Richmond, which is the topic of today's talk. Um, she's also a visiting faculty member at the University of Reading um, and several other things. I, I can't, it's such a long and impressive list. I don't want to keep going over it but rather get right to our talk, but just as a sort of a pitch, if you think you need Paul analysis, here's a person to speak to. So you can always email me and I can get you in touch with Naomi. With that, Naomi, take it over, Jaws. Thank you, Vic. Where is that with the stand? Does it matter? Uh, so yeah, it should be. be here then. Yeah. All right, well, hello everybody. Thank you very much for being here. I am going to be talking to you about a pollen study that I worked on. Um, uh, looking at a garden site found on the grounds of Fort Richmond. Um, Fort Richmond was, uh, oh, how do I get this to go? Someone want to move on. Thank you. Okay, got it. Oh. Uh, let's see if I can The chat, so not. Can I? Nope. Let me try and hear it again. Oh, still something. Right. Let me see what we can do. 
chat if maybe someone telling us to have a technical. Maybe. Asking about websites. <laughs> Or building this sentence for my talk. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so Fort Richmond um, was an eastern frontier fort located in the province of Massachusetts, which is in present day Maine. Uh, the fort dates to between 1720 to 1755, and the garden plot dates to between 1730 to 1745. The garden was identified during a rescue excavation undertaken by the Maine Historic Preservation Commission, led by Lee Smith, in response to planned road construction going right across the site, and that was linked with a bridge replacement project nearby. And when the garden plot was identified, then this um, Lee came up with this aim of trying to determine what plants were actually being cultivated in the garden which is how I came to be involved in the project. And it's this that I'm gonna be talking to you about today. So for the structure of my talk, I'd like to begin by placing it in a wider context for you to highlight you know, why it's important for us to be learning about or trying to figure out what was being grown in this garden. Then I'll give you a little history of Fort Richmond, what we know about the fort. Then I'll briefly outline for you the methods that we use to collect and identify the pollen. I'll, outline, I'll then present my pollen findings, and I'm going to begin by looking at what the pollen tells us about the local vegetation, because it provides an environmental context for the fort and thinking about its position in the landscape. And then I'll go on to focus on the garden taxon. I'll give you an interpretation of these findings. And then I'm going to end with um, some questions that come out of this study for me about what life may have been like at Fort Richmond. And these relate to things like food acquisitioning, medical needs, and thinking about the soldiers as farmers and gardeners. I'm going to throw in a disclaimer at this point um, to let you know that this is the first garden pollen study that I ever did. And my background, as Vic kind of alluded to, is normally um, looking at pollen records spanning the entire Holocene, so looking at the last 12,000 years, and looking at vegetation change through time to investigate human environment interactions. So this project has been a big sidestep for me, but I really enjoyed it, and I'm excited to share with you what I found out. And I realized that there may be people in the audience who know a lot more about forts, and colonial gardens than I do, and I'd love to hear from you at the end of my talk. If there's anything you want to add or any comments you have, then please do. Um, so onto the wider context, and why should we be looking at this pollen? Why should we be trying to figure out what was being grown in this garden? Well, what I would say is it seems that very little is actually known about gardening practices at Eastern Frontier Forest or what was cultivated. From the literature review that I did for this project, I couldn't find any published references to gardens at colonial for forts on the eastern frontier. The closest I could come to was this drawing of Fort George in Maine, dating to 1607 to 1609. And see if I can find the laser pointer. Yep. So maybe this is an area with, with um possible garden plots, but I'm not an expert on forts, so someone who knows more about that could probably could probably help me figure out what that is. But that's the closest I could see that to any possible garden that uh, mentioned at any of these sites or um, alluded to at any of these any of these eastern frontier forts. But when you look to the western frontier forts, there's been a lot more attention given to these. And um, there are published uh, research projects that have drawn on contemporary military documents 
uh, including letters and maps. And what these suggest is that gardens and or small farms were not uncommon at Western Frontier Forts. And in fact, that cultivation was an important part of a soldier's daily routine. And this was necessary because the British army rations were pretty poor to say the least. And there was this need to supplement the, uh, the rations with some kind of fresh food. <laughs> So just to give you an idea of what the rations included, um, they were getting flour or bread, beef or pork, dried peas or beans, molasses, butter or cheese, rice or oatmeal, spruce beer or rum. And if you live on that alone, you're pretty soon gonna get scurvy and you're not gonna be much use to anybody. So what better way of getting fresh fruit and vegetables into your diet than growing these yourselves? So I would argue that the Fort Richmond study is beginning to help to fill this knowledge gap for the Eastern Frontier. Now, on to what we know about Fort Richmond. Uh, it was the first of four timber forts built along the Kennebec River. I have a very general location for you here and I can zoom in for you. And you can see the road running through the site. And this is where the bridge was, it was going to be replaced. So it was right at the heart of a lot of construction work, which is why the rescue excavations took place. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of published research, oh sorry, it's wrong. <laughs> so prior to um, excavation of the of the fort, nothing was really known about what it looked like. Um, there are no contemporary images of the fort, there are no visible remains to tell you that it was there. The closest that we could possibly get, and it's probably not close at all because this is conjectural, is an illustration done by Samuel Adams Drake in the 19th century, over a hundred years after the fort ceased to be in use. However, the location of the fort has always been known, this is what it looks like today, and there's a marker stone just to remind people that it was there. Um, so a lot of what we know about Fort Richmond comes from historical sources. Um, for example, there's a very detailed contemporary ledger from truckmaster John Minow, which includes descriptions of transactions and also of daily activities of the soldiers. Uh, there's also enlistment records, uh, and there's a local history written by the Reverend Thayer in the late 19th century which has a lot of information there as well about the fort. And then the recent archeological excavations have added to what is known about the site. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of what we know. Uh, a log garrison house was built in 1720, 1721 by a group called the Pepper Scott Proprietors, who were a group of businessmen who wanted to establish settlements along the Kennebec River. They petitioned the General Court of Massachusetts for a fort at the site to protect these settlements. They were refused, but they were told, if you build a garrison, we will provide you with soldiers. So that's why. In 1723, however, a fort had actually been built on the site, and this was in response to attacks on the uh, settlements by the local Native Americans. The fort consisted of a collection of wooden buildings within a wooden palisade, and it acted as a trading post. By 1740, it was reported to be in bad disrepair and it was completely rebuilt and enlarged as part of a Massachusetts-wide upgrade of coastal defenses in response to a threat of war from Spain. Um, however, it still appears to have been occupied during this time. So the garden plot that I'm gonna be speaking about is mostly in use during the first phase of the fort, the smaller fort, However, it overlaps slightly into this period of the fort rebuild and the kind of first phase of this new fort. From the very earliest days of the fort um, being at uh, the, uh, from, sorry, from the very earliest days of Fort Richmond, a small community had become established. So we know from enlistment records that between 1730 to 1742, which is when the garden first came into use, there were at least 10 to at least 25 soldiers living at the fort. This number decreased in 1742 to 1745 to at least three soldiers being present at the fort. So that spans the period of use of the garden. 
And in addition to this, there were also seven or eight families of soldiers living in the fort, which weren't included in the enlistment records. And there are mentions, I think, in the truckmaster Minnow's ledger of there being eight workmen living in the fort between 1740 to 1741. So there's a decent number of people living there during this time. Um, there are also some residences around the fort. So um, there was a private residence belonging to Mr. Weymouth, uh, 300 yards away until 1741. There were farmsteads on Swan Island and Dresden Neck. And in 1738, a sawmill became established near the fort and this supplied a lot of the lumber that was used in the fort rebuild. However, the area remained sparsely settled until 1823 when the town of Richmond finally became established. So this image um, here is the first image that we have of what the first wooden fort probably looked like. And this is derived from the work that was done during the rescue excavation. And it was, this image was made by the, uh, constructed by the main department of transportation and the main historic preservation division. And what we have is the original garrison house here, it was already on the site, and then this is what was added to, to turn it into a fort. And it consists of barracks, lodging houses, storehouses, and so forth. And then a wooden palisade was constructed around the fort in 1730, and it's within this palisade that the garden became established at the same time. Now, there is some brief mention of uh, garden produce in the Truckmaster's ledger dating to 1737 to 1742, where he mentions the sale of potatoes. I call them turnips, the next ones, but I think you call them rutabagas, <laughs> um, peas and beans. So the question coming out of this is, you know, were these being grown in the garden and then sold on or are they part of an earlier trade somehow and then being sold on in that way? So the pollen can maybe help to answer that question. There's also some suggestions of the soldiers being involved in farming practices. Bean, soldier bean, owned oxen. And there's a mention of there being beef and leather available from cattle around the fort. So it's suggesting that the fort may have actually been situated in a farming landscape of some sort. Now onto the garden. This plan here um, shows the wooden palisade, and this is the garden plot. It was identified just within the northwest corner of the 1930s palisade. It's approximately five meters by six meters in size, which for those of you who like to work in feet, that's just under 16 and a half feet by 20 feet. Um, uh, it was defined by grey brown clay loam soil, which was softer and easier to dig than elsewhere on the site, and by the presence of small, irregular shaped planting holes, which were evident as darker stains extending a few centimetres into the sterile subsoil. And I just want to show you some of these here. So you can just take them out. And here again. It was a well sealed contact, so it was overlain by clay, which dated to around 1945, uh, sorry, 1745, and that itself was overlain by a 1930s driveway. So there's good potential for pollen preservation. And um, so we've got uh, Lee Smith, who is the lead excavator at the site, when he found the garden plot and he saw it was a well-sealed context, he got in touch with me to see whether it would be possible to try and do a pollen study to figure out what was being grown or uh, being cultivated in the garden. So I said, okay, let's give it a go and see what we find out. So um, the sampling strategy that Lee came up with was to select five individual plant stains for analysis. And he collected bulk samples from these, which were sent to my colleagues at the University of Reading for pollen extraction. They um, made up the slides for me and sent them to me here um, so that I could do the analysis. So it worked very nicely. 
In order to identify the pollen grains, I use published identification guides, which have pollen keys. And I also use comparative material for the Northeast, um, which I had access to through UMass Boston. They have a really good online pollen key that I used, and they also had a, have a pollen textile collection, which had a trick who's the, um, the head of the lab at the Andrew Fisk Center at UMass Boston very kindly let me have access to to nail down the trickier identifications. Um, and now on to my results. So these are images of pollen grains taken from some of my slides, just to give you an idea of what I was looking at. And what I would say is, there was good overall pollen preservation. Um, and what I mean by that is that there are um, the morphological features that are used to help identify pollen grains were still present. They hadn't been bashed around and, um, so that you couldn't see these features. And the sorts of things that we look for are um, surface texture. So for example, Helianthuspa, which is the sunflower group, it has spines over the surface. Ranunculus spur has little black dots that have like a lighter circle around them almost. Um, and then we also have features called cores, which are like little circles on the surface of the grains, like here, for example. And we have things called furrows, which are like little grooves on the surface. And we have one here, and it's actually four right to the end as well. Um, so because I had good pollen preservation, I was able to identify a high enough number of grains to feel that I was getting a representative sample of the range of pollen types present in the slides, which is good. Um, and what I would say is that um, most of the pollen that I was finding, um, I could identify to genus level. Um, so what I mean by this is uh, we have, again, Heliaptus sperm, which is the sunflower group. So there are different species of sunflower within that group. Likewise for ranunculus, for example, it's the buttercup group. There are lots of different species of buttercup within that. And this is typical of pollen studies. Um, for some reason, plants within a genus, even though the, the plants themselves may look different, their pollen grains are often virtually indistinguishable. But sometimes for some reason, um, you can tell the difference. And so that's where we have here, um, Rumex priscus, for example, I was able to get to uh, the species level there because this particular pollen grain has features that are different from others in the genus. And Rumex crispus is entirely dark. Uh, the overall assemblage um, gave me a useful indicator about habitat types around the fork, so providing a useful environmental context. Um, and it also enabled me to identify the um, some probable garden plants being cultivated within the garden plot. So I'm going to begin by considering a wider assemblage and telling you a little bit about that, and then I will go on to focus on uh, the garden taxon. Um, this image here is, take, is um, actually taken from the bridge that was um, right, running right next to the fork site. Um, I, I'm sorry it's fuzzy. I wasn't able to visit the site myself, so I had to find this image on the internet um, from a blog called River Edge, where they talk briefly about the Fort Richmond excavation. Um, but I like this to, to show you this image because it shows you what, what it looks like there today. Um, so Fort Richmond would be kind of behind us over here, basically. Um, uh, and then we're looking north up the river. But what was the vegetation like when the garden was in use at the fort? Uh, well, I found pollen from wetland species, such as alnus, which is alder, reflecting the fort's position on the banks of the Kennebec. I, um, however, most of the pollen I found was associated with cultivation, disturbed ground, um, sorry, cultivation, disturbed grassland, open woodland, scrub, and woodland edge conditions. I found pollen for pine, eastern hemlock, birch, butternut, and hazel. Um, and I believe that these tree types were growing close to the fort because I was finding clumps of grains. Um, normally with pollen, especially if it's wind dispersed, it will be blown quite far from the source. But when you have clumps of grains, they're heavier, and so they tend to fall closer to source. 
So I believe that these trees were growing near the fort. However, the record is predominantly suggesting that there was open disturbed grassland around the fort. If these trees were present, they weren't present as a, as a woodland immediately surrounding the fort. It may have been a woodland edge conditions. Um, and the reason that I'm suggesting that it was open predominantly to start grassland is from the presence of um, ragweed pollen, uh, which is common on roadsides, fields, and cultivated ground. Nettle pollen, which is associated with nutrient-rich soils, found, for example, in middens, privies, livestock shelters. Poison ivy, which is a woodland edge in clearing, uh, associated with some woodland edges and clearings. And then I also found um, spores of bracken fern, which is Teridium aquilinium. And this is indicative of woodland clearance by grazing, fire, and or logging. And one thing I would say about looking at spores on pollen, in pollen samples is that they're usually preserved and it's always worthwhile trying to identify them because it gives you added environmental information. So overall, I would say that the pollen record is um, implying intensive activities and occupation, if you like, of the area of, uh, of the fort and the immediate surroundings. And I would say that this, um, yeah, so there's, a, there's intensive activities going on at and immediately around the fort. Um, so now onto the garden plants. Um, I was able to deter identify a range of probable garden taxa in the pollen record relating to vegetables, salad greens, a fruit or possibly fruits, and herbs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's difficult to get down to species level with pollen identification. Um, and so to help with this and to try and identify the most likely garden plants that were represented by the pollen, I looked at the dietary preferences of the period and I was also fortunate that there were two um, published um, garden diaries from nearby, from similar period in time, which I could refer to as well. Um, the first of these is by the Reverend Jacob Bailey, who lived in Dresden around five miles away. And his, his diary dates to the late 18th century. And then also Martha Ballard, who is a midwife and herbalist, she lived in Hallowell, about 16 miles away, and her diary dates to the late 18th, early 19th century. So on this basis, I suggest that these are the range of vegetables that are represented by uh, the pollen grains that I identified. We have, oh gosh, sorry, <laughs> we have allium spur, um, which could include onion, garlic, chives, scallion, and or leeks. We have Brassica oleracea type, which could include cabbage, cauliflower, and or broccoli. And these were all commonly consumed vegetables at this time. Um, for Helianthus fir, which is the sunflower group, I've got a question mark here for Jerusalem artichoke, also called tuberous sunflower. The reason for this is that, uh, the reason I'm suggesting that we might have Jerusalem artichoke is because it was a common vegetable at the time, during the period. And there's also a reference, or I should say a possible reference to Jerusalem artichoke in the Reverend Bailey's diary. He mentions small sunflower. So he doesn't call it Jerusalem artichoke, he calls it small sunflower. But he sourced it from the wild, to cultivate in his garden to eat as a vegetable. So that's a, it's a possibility. And then for Solanum spur, that can include potato or tomato, but it's most likely to be potato because during this period, tomato was considered poisonous and rarely consumed. <laughs> and we have our drug master's uh, ledger mentioning the sale of potatoes, which is uh, nice to have a little overlap there. Now, interestingly, I also found pollen for maize, uh, which suggests that this was being cultivated near the fort. Studies elsewhere have suggested that maize pollen 
is usually deposited within a kilometer from the source plant. So this could have come from a field or fields of maize on Swan Island or Dresden Neck, but it could equally have come from fields closer to the port, surrounding the port. And I found this quote in a book about domestic colonial gardens, but I think you can also apply it here, which suggests that vegetables needed in large quantities, such as maize, beans, and pumpkins were grown in fields, whilst those needed on a small scale were grown in the fencing garden near the house. So again, it's less likely that maize was being cultivated in the garden, more likely to be cultivated in a field. And I like the fact that it also mentions beans, because in the truck master's ledger, he mentioned the sale of beans. And we didn't find any beans in the fallen record. So I think that's interesting. Now onto the salad beans. Uh, most of these we would consider as weeds today. Um, however, they were commonly eaten during this period and they're useful for both cooking and household remedies. We have chickweed which was effective against scurvy and often eaten boiled or in salads and pies. Chicory, which was a coffee substitute and a winter salad vegetable. Dandelion, which was a salad green, a drink, a diuretic and useful for digestion. White mustard, also referred to sometimes as charlock, which was considered to be an indispensable part of the English diet. And then we also have curly dog. For fruits, I found pollen and ribes. For ribes includes both currants and gooseberries. They occur naturally in the local landscape. And I think there's a good possibility that, although I can't say for certain, but I think there's a good possibility that they were cultivated in the garden plot. The reason I suggest this is because both are listed as garden plants by the Reverend Bailey. He went out into the wild, he sourced them to cultivate in his garden. And then finally, the herbs. So these herbs are typical of the period and many also have potential therapeutic uses. We have yarrow, which was used to treat toothache, diarrhea, stem bleeding, hair tonic, and an alternative to hops. We have St. John's wort, which was an astringent and anti-inflammatory disinfectant, could be used to treat bladder ailments, dysentery, diarrhea, worms, commonly drunk as a tea to treat tuberculosis. That's a useful one to you garden, sure. <laughs> Lots of uses. And then thyme, used as a seasoning, an antiseptic to treat intestinal and respiratory ailments and as a deodorant. <laughs> And one thing that, that really struck me when I was looking into the, the uses of the different herbs is that surely this gives us some kind of insight into the potential needs of the people living at the fort. Presumably they're you know, selecting what they want to grow there for particular purposes. And we don't know for sure what they are, but I just, I think it's an interesting, interesting little window possibly into what their needs might have been. So this table here just pulls together all of the different pollen types that I found, or the, the cultivars associated with pollen types that I found. And what I would say is that this garden assemblage is typical of the period and the region. However, there's a much smaller variety of plants in this assemblage than those described elsewhere. So thinking back to the diaries, the published diaries that I was referring to, there's a much wider range of plants described in there. And there's also um, a nice quote from a Colonel Williams, who in 1757 wrote a letter to a Boston seed merchant ordering seeds for a Western frontier, possibly, uh, sorry, Western frontier fort or possibly group of forts. In this order, he was asking for four kinds of cabbage, two kinds of lettuce, two varieties of turnip, onions, dead and squash, cucumber, squash pepper, which was probably a kind of bell pepper, four kinds of peas, radish, parsley, parsnips, beans, asparagus, and an assortment of herbs. 
And of these, only the onion, the cabbage, and an assortment of herbs were identified in Fort Richmond on record. So the differences between what I found at Fort Richmond and with, for example, the seed order and these are domestic garden diaries describing a wider range of plants, um, I would suggest is possibly due to, first of all, differences in provisioning between the eastern and western frontier ports, perhaps, um, but also due to gaps in pollen record. <laughs> um, and uh, when I speak about gaps in the pollen record, these are inevitable. And um, for garden plants, oftentimes they are uh, insect pollinated. And so the pollen is not always transported as far from source as you would have with wind pollinated plants. So in that respect, it may be that the pollen that we're, we're getting from the samples that were collected may represent simply what was growing close by. And so it's not, giving us a full, uh, a full list of all of the plants that were being cultivated at the fort. And if you go back again to Captain Minow's account book, we have potatoes in the pollen record, but we don't have the turnips, we don't have the peas, and we don't have the bees. So we're getting questions coming out of this, I, I think, more questions. Um, and so I just want to end by identifying some of the kind of the four main questions that come out of it for me some of which I can address and some of which I can't. Um, first of all, I alluded to the herbs reflecting possibly specific needs of those living in the fort. I think that's an interesting thing to think about. That might be an interesting project for somebody in the future. Um, also this question of foraging to supplement dietary and or medicinal needs. There's mention of this by Martha Ballard in her diary, by the Reverend Bailey in his diary, going out into the wild, collecting plants to cultivate in the garden, um, in their gardens. But also it was common practice of the day for people to go out into the local environment and collect plants, not even necessarily to cultivate, but for, for medicinal purposes. And that's something which is hidden from us, at least through the pollen network. We can't answer that, but I think it's something interesting to think about. Could enough food be grown in the garden to feed everyone in the fort? And were the soldiers also farmers? Uh, these last two questions I'm going to attempt to answer as far as I can today. Um, and then I'm going to conclude. So food production at Fort Richmond. Could enough food be grown in this garden to feed everyone living in the fort? Now that we have a sense of the type of uh, plants that are being cultivated. Well, we know that there was a small community at Port Richmond and the pollen record is suggesting that there was intensive use of the immediate surroundings. The, uh, we have conservative estimates, as I mentioned earlier, of fort occupancy. So we have at least 10 to at least 25 soldiers living at the fort during the first phase uh, of garden use. And then towards the end of the, the period of the garden's use, we had at least three soldiers living there. In addition to this, we have families of seven or eight married soldiers and eight workmen. So at the upper end of the estimate, you're probably looking at at least 40 people living at the fort, potentially. And I would suggest that there probably wasn't enough space within the garden plot to grow enough food to feed all of these people. And one thing I, I realized halfway through that I forgot to mention on my title slide, and I have it again in the back end of this slide, there's a picture of a, a colonial garden. From, uh, it's from Colonial Williamsburg, and it's showing you what a kitchen garden would look like. And the, in the background, it's actually giving you the garden plot that's shown in the background is similar in size to the garden plot that I'm talking about. So something this size, I would suggest, is probably not big enough to feed everything. So what I think was happening at the fort was that there were multiple garden plots. And this was common practice at the time. And it makes sense because you want to grow your plants where they're going to grow best based on how much light they need, drainage, um, also how close they are to your house. You know, if you want 
you want plants you're going to be harvesting on a daily basis closer to your house than those that you don't you're not going to be harvesting as excuse me as frequently. Um, and I asked Lee Smith, the lead excavator, if they found any other garden plots during the excavation, and he said that they hadn't. But he thinks that it's highly likely that there were other garden plots within and outside the palisade. So this leads on to the question, could there then have been a surplus of vegetables for sale if there were multiple garden plots? We have the potato pollen, so we know they were growing potatoes at the port, but what about the turnips, the peas and the beans? The quote I showed you earlier suggested that the beans, and um, on that basis probably also peas, would usually be grown in fields rather than within a, a smaller garden plot. Um, possibly also the same for turnips, I'm not sure. Um, one way of possibly answering this question might be to go to the truck master's ledger and see if there's any mention of an earlier transaction where these vegetables were being somehow traded to the fort and then sold on. And if there is a mention of that, then perhaps we can say, okay, these were being grown up for, for sale. And I think that there's additional support for the argument of there being fields uh, supplementing crops grown in the garden plot by the presence of the, the maize pollen, possibly. There are fields somewhere nearby, anyway. <laughs> so were Fort Richmond soldiers also farmers? I would suggest that the pollen record and Truckmaster's, Truckmaster Minnow's ledger both suggest yes. We have pollen evidence for open to start grassland and plants associated with cultivation, for example, the ragweed pollen. We know from the ledger that bean, soldier bean, owned oxen, and that beef and leather were available for cattle around the fort. So I suggest that the garden plot within the palisade was probably part of a more comprehensive agricultural system at Fort Richmond. And this is in keeping with findings from Western Frontier Forks, where it's been suggested that many functioned as small farms in the same manner as local domestic farms. So I suggest that a similar situation probably existed at Fort Richmond. So to conclude, several garden plants were identified in the Fort Richmond farm report. It wasn't possible to reconstruct the full garden assemblage, I don't think, because there wasn't the, as big, a, uh, big a, a selection of plants being represented as you would expect to find. Nevertheless, these findings provide a useful insight into what was cultivated in the garden plot. And I think that the results do help to illuminate, or at least begin to illuminate, an important but otherwise hidden aspects of life, of daily life and subsistence on the Eastern Frontier. Um, and I'd just like to end by thanking uh, Lisa Smith for inviting me to be involved in the project and for supplying all the images and actually putting questions for me. Uh, Heather Trigg for giving me access to the uh, pollen type slide collections at UMass Boston. My colleagues at the University of Reading for preparing my samples and the Native Plant Trust, who have an amazing website um, called Go Botany. If you ever want to identify plants you see growing around your house and you want to know whether they're native or not and what their range is and any other piece of information, this, this website will tell you. Um, and a lot of the plant images I use came from that website. And thank you for listening. That's it. Any questions from the audience? And then we can see if you have some chat questions from the greater audience. I have a question. Was there any indication of, of, of soldier rations, sort of like from, from our master saying that we, you know, not to pay the soldiers in, in the currency, which would have been a short, very short supply, but that they get a uh, supply of potatoes or other vegetable matter? There might have been. I didn't look into that in a lot of detail. I was focusing mainly on the pollen, but 
if I'd had more time, for sure, that's a, that would be why reading up on it. Yeah, more closely. Because I mean, it may suggest why we find certain species within the garden, they're bringing certain things in, they want other things to supplement the food, though I'm not sure that dietary case were as demanding as I are today. Anyone else have that? Yeah, I'm just curious the mechanics, if you could show me over there. How do you mechanics of getting to your microscope or whatever you turn to the first How do you go through that process? Um, well, if you take a you take your sample and then you have to uh, you will sieve it to get rid of the bits that you don't want, and you go through various stages of chemical processing to remove organic matter. And if you have um, sand in your sample, you might want to get rid of that. And eventually, you end up with um, the pollen. Pollen is very um, hardy. It can just withstand a lot of harsh chemical treatments. The other um, matter that you find in sediments can't. So you basically, you hit it with a lot of hard chemicals and then eventually you get pollen and spores and sometimes you get micro charcoal will also be present and other bits of other small organic fragments, but it's mainly the pollen. Uh, and then you mount them up onto slides and then you, you can compare. And then you can, uh, yeah, so then you'll, um, there are published pollen keys that you can use, which will take you through the steps and get more of different morphological features to um, help narrow it down and then you can compare with um, uh, type slides. So where it's just one particular pollen type that's been, <laughs> that's been sampled specifically so that you can then compare and see, you know, see whether what you have matches what you know for sure is a particular pollen type. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Why is there any wild dog? Um, because that was a very popular. I didn't find any. I'm 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 not sure actually. Sorry. <laughs> After the revolution, with these gardens abandoned, or did the locals take it over? Sure. So um, at Fort Richmond, actually, it's interesting that I mentioned the Reverend Bailey, who lived in Dresden. He actually ended up living at the remains of the fort for a while. Um, and uh, so presum presumably he would have had a garden there. It wasn't the same garden plot that I was looking at, but he continued his gardening practices on the site. Um, but the building itself had been, I don't think there was a whole lot of it left. At the time, I'm not sure which part of it he was living in. But, uh -huh. So the locals don't take or still as what they did the natives. I don't know. I'm sorry. But, yeah, I wish I did. <laughs> and when you're assuming that soil, do you find out what they used for fertilizer? Uh, I mean, I guess if you did the right chemical treatments, you could, but that wasn't something that I was looking at. Is there any questions in the chat? Oh, sorry, John. Yeah. Oh, uh, was there any uh, settlement in terms of whether there were other farmsteads? Sure. So there was the um, residence of Mr. Weymouth 300 yards away. So presumably he would have been farming. Um, and then there was the uh, farms on Swan Island and Dresden Neck, which were fairly close by on the other side of the river. Um, so they would have also had farming activities. Sure. <laughs> so uh, how would you distinguish between Sure, so the maize pollen is a good example of that. That could easily have come from crops being grown further away. Um, the other pollen types, they could have been flown into the site, um, but a lot of them are insect pollinated, and so they don't travel quite as far. Um, but yeah, you can never be absolutely sure that you're getting Unless you're getting the clumps of rings, that's helpful, or plant macrofossils, which are deposited very close to the source. One question we have from the chat is um, if you have active website. No. Uh, no website currently. 
see any other questions from the chat. Anybody have any questions online? I think we'll close the. Yeah, like another... All right. Yeah, go ahead. Well, thank you again, Naomi. Thanks for the local side. Just for the audience, um, the online audience, just to remind you that our next meeting will be at Tapley Hall of the Tapley Memorial Hall of the Danvers Historical Society. And that's um, Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. So hopefully we'll see you then. We'll get an announcement out and uh, let you know some more details. But thank you all for participating. And uh, hopefully we'll see you then. I can't guarantee we'll have virtual at that meeting, but we'll try our best. Thank you.